In this video, we're going to look at open and common field systems. Now, I know not everybody's interested in farming for its own sake, but the point is you don't have to go back very far in time until most people are either farmers or agricultural laborers. And even if they were blacksmiths or potters or something like that, they were selling to farmers or making farming tools. And very much of this farming happened in open or common fields. Even if you live in a town or a city, the part of the town that you live in was probably countryside not very long ago. For instance, a historian called Maurice Beresford showed how Victorian terraces in Leeds were set out within the boundaries of old fields. And indeed, many of the big northern industrial cities like Birmingham or Manchester were not really cities until the 18th or 19th centuries. Even London, which has been a metropolis for many centuries, you don't have to go very far out on the tube before you come to stations with names like Chalk Farm. And this historic map of London shows animals being grazed just next to Charing Cross. Medieval towns also had their own fields as well. They were not solely mercantile communities. Open or common fields were essentially the normal way to farm in the Middle Ages and the Tudor and Stuart periods, although they began to disappear gradually. From that time on, they were still quite common through the 18th century and into the early 19th century, but in Britain at any rate, became less normal through the 19th century and are essentially gone in Great Britain. But they're a pan-European phenomenon. They existed right across the continent. And indeed, there are parts of France and Germany, nearly all of Austria, where they are still quite common. We've probably all eaten bread made from flour ground, from grain grown in open fields. If you're doing local history, wherever you are, you are going to meet the open fields sooner or later. And they can be quite tricky and technical. So the point of this video is to give a little introduction to let you understand things that you come across. So what are they? This is a map of an imaginary open field community. The white areas divided into lots of thin strips are the open fields. They are the land on which crops were grown, that is arable land. And there are two important features of any open or common field system. Firstly, a farm consists of lots of small strips of land mixed up with strips belonging to other farms. On this map, the strips of one farm are shown in red. Let's call these holdings rather than farms, because farm is actually a modern term and meant rather different things in the past. The second important feature of an open or common field system is that after the harvest, or when land is fallow, that is when a crop's not being grown on it so that it can recover some of its fertility, everyone in the community can put their livestock on that land, regardless of whose farm the strips in particular belong to. Now, there can be a little more to it than that. Very often, land is divided into very large fields. And this isn't what we mean by field today. They're much bigger and they contain strips belonging to many, in fact, usually most farmers within a community. And these fields are the basis usually of a crop rotation. So one or several of the fields might be fallow in one year. That is, everybody who holds land within that field keeps it fallow. And obviously that makes it easier to have everybody grazing that land. Then in the other fields, you would have crops which tend to be harvested at the same time. And again, that makes the grazing rights a bit easier. In the Midlands, Midland England that is, this rotation became quite formalized, perhaps because there tended to be much less permanent pasture in that part of the country than elsewhere. Communities in the English Midlands tended to have two or more often three fields, one in winter grain, 
that's grain that's sown in winter, one in spring grain and one fallow. The cultivation of each field was changed every year so that in three years, each field would have passed through all three courses of the rotation. These fields were divided into furlongs, which are little blocks of strips, and each furlong would have grown one crop. So different furlongs within the same field could have grown different crops, so long as they were to be harvested at the same time. This is called the Bibden system or the three field system. Some people have recently begun using open fields to refer only to this and common fields to refer to any fields with strips and common grazing. But this is quite a recent distinction. So in books or papers written before about 2010, you'll find the terms common and open fields used quite freely. Now there are lots of different types other than the Midland system. So for instance, in the West Country, you get infield outfield systems, where there's infield land that's cultivated every year, and outfield land that's cultivated only when needed. In parts of the north of England, field systems often have many more than three fields. In East Anglia, where there are some quite light sandy soils, a system called the sheep corn system developed, in which sheep were grazed on permanent pieces of pasture and moved on to the arable land at night where they were kept in a fold in order to manure the fields and the management of this fold course was a very important part of the system. Whilst open fields were very widespread, they weren't everywhere. There have probably always been little pieces of enclosed land alongside common fields, as we can see on this map of Laxton in Northamptonshire. And there were also commons, that is permanent grazing land. And there used to be an idea that the Midlands system was the most advanced type and that other systems were survivals of older forms, but this is no longer accepted. Really each system is an adaptation to different environmental, legal or social conditions. With something as complicated and involving as much cooperation as these types of field systems, there of course had to be a body to administer it. Very often that was a man of court, but in other cases there might be a village meeting specifically for this purpose. I intend to cover manners in a later video. One of the things that can make understanding open or common fields tricky is that there's quite a lot of jargon. And partly this is due to the fact that there's often a Latin term and an English term for each different thing. We've come across some of these already that are associated with the physical layout of the field. So we've already met furlongs, which are blocks of strips within a field. Usually these have a headland at one end, that's a strip of grass that was used for turning the plow team around. Sometimes odd little pieces of land which aren't big enough for a proper furlong, it might be called butts or gores. A lay is a strip or perhaps a few strips together that have been put down to pasture temporarily, perhaps for a few years, perhaps for one year. But in addition to the normal fallow, it's also for the same reason for recovering fertility. And this might have become more common in the Tudor and Stuart periods. The strips themselves are often called lands or cellians, cellian being the Latin term. In many places, there was a standard size of holding within each open field system. The size differed between different places depending on their history and on soil quality. When people bought or sold or inherited these, they typically bought the whole thing or a fraction of it, half or a quarter. 
There are lots of different names for these standard holdings. The terms husbandland and bondland are quite general. More specific are the terms vergate or yardland and bovate or oxgang, which were common in the Middle Ages. Vergate and bovate being the Latin, and yardland and oxgang the English equivalents. Vergates and, or yardlands are typically found in the south, whereas bovates and oxgangs are common in the north of England. An oxgang is very approximately half the size of a vergate, but there is variation in both between different communities, so it's impossible to be precise. You'll come across the terms demean and glebe too. These aren't strictly open field phenomena. They can exist in places where there aren't open fields, but they are related. Glebe is farmland owned by the parish church. The priest uses this land for his income. He could farm it himself or could rent it to other people. Because bishops liked to keep track of this land, periodically there were surveys made and these are called glebe terriers. You do get terriers of other farms, but glebe terriers are the most common. And these are simply a list of strips within the glebe in a particular parish. And this is an example of part of one from Harvey in Leicestershire. And we can see its list of strips with the name of the particular furlong and the name of the neighbor of the glebe in each case. So for instance, we have one land butting on the Millgate, Thomas Doubleday East, two lands, that's two strips next to one another, in the Millgate, Thomas Truman East, one land beyond the mill, Duke of Rutland West, and so on. The demean is the holding worked directly by the Lord of the Manor. It's often in strips interspersed among the rest of the open field holdings, but it can be in a block on its own. The owners of the holdings in the manor owe labour services to the Lord, usually on the demean land, though Lords might hire labour too. Labour services might be commuted into money payments instead, and this became more and more common through the Middle Ages. In the first half of the Middle Ages, when labour was cheap and food expensive, it was profitable for lords of manors to work their domains directly. When the Black Death happened in 1349, population fell, meaning that labour became expensive and food cheap. And so it became more profitable for the lord to rent it to someone else who could put in more direct attention and perhaps combine it with other land nearby. What sort of evidence might we use to show where open fields had once been? In some cases, there is earthwork evidence in the form of ridge and furrow. These are long parallel ridges, which are quite familiar in the English countryside. They form because of the way the plough works and the way in which open field strips were ploughed. These are two ploughs of the types used in open field systems. That on the left is a medieval or Tudor English plough found in a church in Bassenborn in Cambridgeshire. And the one on the right is an historic photograph from the first half of the 20th century, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe. The plough does two things. It uses the coulter, which is like a large knife to cut into the soil. We can see that on the Eastern European plough, but it's missing from the Bassenborn plough. And then the share digs underneath this cut, lifts the soil up, and the mould board turns the soil over to one side. There are ploughs that have mould boards on both sides and turn the soil in two directions, but typically in medieval England, the mould board was on one side, that is, it was asymmetrical. This animation shows how open field strips were ploughed. The plough team would go up one side of the strip, turn around on the headland, and go down the opposite side. In each case, moving soil from the edges to the centre of the strip 
and building a bridge. At the same time, the neighboring farmers were plowing their strips in a similar fashion, moving soil away from their neighbor strips and towards the center of their own, thus making a furrow in between each ridge. Ridge and furrow does not nest always show open field systems. Ridge and furrow, or at least earthworks very much like it, were created in some cases just for drainage in the 18th and 19th centuries. And there are some pieces of ridge and furrow which are thought to have resulted from the use of Victorian steam plows. Usually all of these types are quite distinctive. And they're normally straighter and narrower than proper open field ridge and furrow. And they usually conform exactly to the modern field path. In some cases, ridge and furrow follows a reversed S shape, sometimes called an anorateral curve. And this develops because of the way the plough was turned on the headland. Essentially, the turn was begun before the end of the strip was reached. And this is much clearer evidence of open field systems. Sometimes when the open fields were being enclosed and the modern landscape created, the shapes of open fields were preserved within the enclosed field patterns. So you'll see fields with erratoral curves or fields which are long, thin strips. Now, of course, not all common fields were enclosed like this. Sometimes the landowners got together and made an agreement to enclose the entire field system in one go, in which case usually these patterns do not survive. And finally, of course, there are maps, surveys, deeds and manorial court documents. Maps of common fields are relatively rare, but most counties have a few. And a historian called David Hall has recently written a book on open field systems, which, as well as being a very detailed introduction, has a useful gazetteer of open field maps as an appendix. As we said, the manorial court was often used to regulate common field systems, to make and enforce the bylaws which governed the way in which farming was done within the open field system in question. And they were also used to record the purchase and sale and inheritance of land within open fields. So they also give you a lot of information. What sort of things might we be interested in finding out by studying open field systems? The main interest really is that the open field system of any one community developed quite organically on its own. So there are great differences between different places. And without studying lots and lots of individual open field systems, we really don't have a good idea of how they worked overall. So simply studying the way in which they functioned is useful. More generally, figuring out how they fitted into a community as the backdrop of most people's lives and as presumably a um, forum for much of their social interactions with their neighbors. The way in which they originated and why they took the form they did is very unclear and it has been subject of quite serious academic debate for many decades. We do know more than we used to, but still there isn't really a fully satisfactory answer. The way they ended is important too. The enclosure movement, which I'll cover in a later video in detail, and 
the conflicts, or in some cases, lack of conflicts over it, are important questions. Finally, we can also look at the way in which the physical form of open field systems changed. Sometimes there are agreements to change them wholesale, but very often there were little piecemeal rearrangements of parts of the open field system. And sometimes we can see these on maps where one furlong cuts into another, showing that it is later. As we can see on this map of Harvey in Leicestershire. So that's a very brief introduction to open field systems. There is, of course, an awful lot more to them, but this should give you what you need to begin going out and reading about them yourself, or enough information to understand them if they come up in your research into other things.